Christendom is healing over dangerously, perhaps almost capsizing. Some people would say probably today it will correct itself insofar as the ballast returns to liturgy and sacramental communion with God. Well, hey everyone, what is up? Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Austin and this is Gospel Simplicity, a place where we seek to bring simplicity out of theological and historical complexity. Today, I am joined by Father John Strickland. and We're talking about the Great Schism, which if you watch my channel, you probably have heard of, but in case you haven't, it refers to the excommunication of the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Pope of Rome mutually in 1054 and kind of marks the division between the East and the West, or what we often refer to now as the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. But more than just talking about kind of the theology or the filioque way, things that get went into that, in this video, we're talking about kind of the cultural dynamics that were at play that led to that, and then that came as a result of that. Specifically, he talks about the loss of this view of the world that had been so prominent in the first millennium, that idea of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God, which he refers to as paradise. That's a lot, and he's gonna explain it better than I just did, but hopefully that whets your appetite for what you're about to hear. Before we get to the video, I wanna say a real quick thank you so much to my patrons, subscribers, and merch buyers who make this channel possible, especially to my patrons, those who give monthly to support this channel to help it keep going and growing. Thank you all so, so much. If you'd like to be a patron and get all types of fun perks like discount codes for merch or potentially free merch, depending on your tier, early access to interviews, to watch the videos without the ads on them or this long run up right here, you can go to patreon.com slash gospel simplicity, or if you'd like to make a one-time gift, you can go to paypal.me slash gospel simplicity. Well, with all that being said, here's the video. Well, today I am joined by Father John Strickland. Father John grew up in Orange County, California of Episcopalian background. Falling in love with Russian history while an undergraduate, he embarked on a career of historical study that resulted in earning a PhD and teaching at several colleges. While living in St. Petersburg, Russia for his dissertation research on church history, he began att attending a local Orthodox parish and with time was received into the Orthodox church there. While in Petersburg, he also met his future wife, Yelena. Together, they now have five children. Father John maintains an historical blog and podcast under the title Paradise and Utopia and enjoys woodworking. He is also the author of several books on cultural history, including The Age of Paradise, The Age of Division, which we'll be discussing today, and the recently released Age of Utopia, Christendom from the Renaissance to the Russian Revolution. Father John, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me, Austin. It's real good to be with you. Well, it is my pleasure, and I'm glad we've been able to get to this point. Viewers won't know, but it's been a journey getting here, and I'm so excited to be able to have this conversation today. Well, as I mentioned, we're going to be discussing your book, The Age of Division, which I believe is out by Ancient Faith uh, Publishing. I'll have links to that in the description. But as I mentioned, this is part of kind of a multi-volume project. Three out of the four have been released to date. Could you just let us know a little bit of what you're up to in this project? Yeah, uh, the the project is four volumes in all. It's uh, project. The project title is uh, Paradise and Utopia: The Rise and Fall of What the West Once Was. Uh, it's an effort to understand where we are today in our cultural situation in the West by taking a um, journey back in time, kind of a genealogical look back in time uh, to the origins of what we can call the West, uh, the civilization and culture that we call the West and to see um, what's going on today, which a lot of Christians feel very uncomfortable and, and alarmed by, uh, the things happening in culture and the, the separation of, of Western culture from Christianity and Christian influence, uh, to try to understand that by, taking, by, by looking at the deep history of the West. A lot of um, people are commenting today about the situation, the cultural situation, the malaise of the West, and they do so by uh, bringing attention insofar as they look historically at origins, they bring attention to things like the sexual revolution, which occurred about a generation ago. I actually kind of lived through that as a child. Um, didn't participate in it so much, but I, I lived through it. I saw it happening around me. Um, uh, others would go back further in time. They'd look to the Enlightenment as being the big kind of change, the sea change in the history of Western culture with the rise of secularism and things like that. 
Others would go back further and they'd look at the Protestant Reformation and uh, important developments that happened then in laying a foundation for modern culture. Um, a few might even go a little bit further back into the late so-called Middle Ages to the rise of nominalism and other intellectual um, trends at that time. But what I think is important to do uh, as an Orthodox Christian is to, who's a, West, who, who's a member of Western culture and grew up in the West, as a Western Orthodox, you might say. What I think is important is to go back even further um, into the uh, f first millennium, uh, back beyond all those other points of reference. All, all those points, by the way, are very valid and important, but to understand where those came from, I think one needs to go back to um, the first millennium to see what Western civilization and culture was like for th that period of time, which is really about a, well, it's about a thousand years in length. Um, and my, um, my important point of, of transition is the 11th century when the Great Schism occurred uh, that, that separated East and West, that separated what's now known as the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. Um, I think that really is the turning point. I think everything else flows out of that. The Reformation, uh, not nominalism, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the sexual revolution, all of that can be made sense of if we look more deeply into our past and not just at more relatively re recent events, um, you know, that are only 500 years old, which is not so old if you're, uh, you know, you're an Orthodox Christian anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. And what I find really interesting about this work as, as a cultural history is that so often as one growing up in the West and educated in the West, I didn't really hear much about the Great Schism as a cultural kind of <clears throat> turning point outside of maybe church history classes. That's something that yeah. we talk about in theology with the filioque or something like that. But in terms of just the history of Western civilization, it's not something that's generally on a lot of people's radar, I think. And so I'm interested to see, as we go through this interview, kind of some of the things that this sparked and kind of the, the aftershocks of this schism. But for those that are just trying to wrap their heads around this or to kind of orient them to this conversation, what is this schism and why is it so important, not just for church history, but for Western society? Yeah, I, I, I was just like you, Austin, and I think a lot of people are in the West. We grow up thinking there are two Christian options. One is Roman Catholic, if it's if you're going to be drawn toward a traditional liturgical sacramental, you know, kind of definition of Christianity. The other is Protestant, if you're drawn more toward a scriptural I mean, again, I don't want to get into, you know, characterizations that don't mean much, but those are the two poles. And, and as an Orthodox Christian who converted from Protestantism, um, you know, you, I've come to see, and I think a lot of people speak this way who are Orthodox, come to see those two poles as really being two sides of the same coin. They're really very similar in so many ways that you don't see uh, in, the, in, the, in the kind of culture and context of, of the West you have to kind of step out of that. That's the reason why it's effective and useful. In fact, necessary for us to go back to the first millennium when those 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 didn't exist. There was there was a united Christendom um, throughout you know most of what we'd call the West. So um, the 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 Great Schism, as it's known, uh, is usually of course dated to 1054. It's got a lot of prehistory to it. And it's got a lot of post history to it. 1054 is a relatively arbitrary date, but it means something. At that on, that on that date, a representative of the Pope of Rome came to Constantinople, and even though the Pope had died in the meantime in route, when he was in route, his name was Cardinal Humbert, um, and therefore uh, he no longer had a legitimate uh, embassy. He, he had no legitimate um, uh, a kind of role to play as a representative of now a dead Pope. Nevertheless, he excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople um, on grounds that we could go into. But anyway, that's the effect of what he did. And the favor was returned by the Patriarch of Constantinople. And this all happened in 1054, in July 1054. And so from that point forward, um, there were efforts to reunite East and West together. Uh, but those efforts failed, of course. And, um, and the result was uh, what's called the Great Schism, or in, in my books, I prefer just to more, more emphatically call it the Great Division, the Great Division, which is the launching point for the book we're talking about today, The Age of Division, Christendom from the Great Schism to the Protestant Reformation.
Yeah, and I, I wanted to start with this book here. I mean, all three of the books that you've put out seem very interesting to me, but this seems to kind of be the, the crux of it, right? The, the kind of turning point in the series that has shaped the West so much, and then you're kind of expanding on that as you go, and then giving kind of the back history, or showing the idea of the Age of Paradise before this. I appreciate also kind of the nuance you brought with that, even to the point of the, the death of the Pope there, which I know has some implications for some people who are interested in these things. But you also mentioned that in some ways, this dating, while significant, can be arbitrary in other ways. I think some people might be wondering, well, what, what exactly does he mean by that? And so just briefly, I, I think, I imagine maybe what you're getting at here, this question might help elucidate it. If we were to go back to 1054, and we were, say, I don't know, somewhere in the Byzantine Empire, or I know some of my uh, subscribers might prefer just the Roman Empire in, in the East. We'll, uh, we'll let them decide on that. But um, to what extent would they have known what was going on in 1054? Would this have been like an immediate, oh my goodness, the world is changing? Or would it have been, there was a skirmish between some legates and the patriarch, and they said some things, and, you know, I'm sure this will kind of blow over. Can... Can you kind of put us in the shoes of people who would have been alive at that time? Like, how significant would this have felt? That's a great question. <clears throat> I think that's a great question. And, of course, I think the, the uh, answer is, of course, of course, first of all, it's just acknowledge we have very few documents. So wouldn't it be great to, um, you know, have a document from some local newspaper, you know, in the region of Serbia or, let's say, um, you know, Kiev, let's say, which had just recently received Orthodox Christianity um, about uh, 50 years earlier under uh, Vladimir, Grand Prince Vladimir. Wouldn't it be great to read the Kiev Daily Post, you know, <laughs> headlines, you know, uh, Cardinal Humbert, representative of the papacy, uh, excommunicates Patriarch of Constantinople, and, and, uh, and the same happens uh, from the point of view of Patriarch of Constantinople, you know, and let's interview the local bishop in Kiev and ask him, what he thinks about this and what's going on in the local parish churches. We have our guy on the scene, our reporter, you out in front of uh, um, St. Sophia Cathedral in, in Kiev. Um, of course, we don't have that kind of documentation from that period of time, so it's somewhat speculative. What is written is written by the people usually that are involved in the disputes, and of course, those points of view are very, very tendentious. They're very, you know, they're very opinionated. Cardinal Humbert actually did write um, a report and an account of this, but of course his point of view is, is obviously his point of view. Um, I think uh, to try to reconstruct a sense of uh, your excellent kind of question, um, uh, re reconstruct, to create a, an answer to it, I think very little would have changed. Very little would have changed. Um, I, for, for a while, for a long while, decades, even a, cent a century or two, um, there were places in Christendom, East and West, that, you know, just shrugged their shoulders if they heard of it at all. I mean, I suppose that probably in, uh, in Ireland or, you know, Northern England or something like that, very little was known about this for decades, probably. And this had happened before. It didn't happen often, so we shouldn't overemphasize that, but it had happened before. There was something that I call the Nicolaitan schism, which historians coming from a Western point of view that's shaped by the Roman Catholic view of things often call the Photian schism because it involved Patriarch Photios of Constantinople in the, in the ninth century. But it, the schism itself, the separation of communion, um, actually was initiated by the Pope of that time named Nicholas. So from my point of view, I think an Orthodox understanding of that would be that it was really the Nicolaitan schism. But those had been healed in the past. This one was never healed. And so I think the answer to your question is, is that at first, very little happened. Very little cultural consequences were, were evident. Um, but with time, and say a century and a half later, it's pretty clear that something has happened. It happened long ago from that point of view. And by 1204, you know, most historians would say the schism is, is cemented in place by the, um, by the conquest of Constantinople by now Roman Catholic uh, armies uh, under the command of the Pope, even though the Pope at that time, Innocent III, had not wanted Constantinople attacked, he made the most of it and imposed a Roman Catholic patriarch on the throne in Constantinople, declaring this great schism to be at an end through the use of military power. 
So it took, uh, in short, a couple of uh, centuries uh, probably to play out, but certainly did play out. And, and with time, as we know well enough today, there are real differences between East and West. And my argument is, is those differences are most fruitfully traced back to the 11th century's Great Schism. Um, my argument is, is that the Great Schism mattered in the history of the West. Um, usually it's ignored, as you said earlier. It's just a church history kind of thing. And Roman Catholics and um, Orthodox can, you know, disagree about its its meaning, but it's just something that belongs to, you know, a kind of a footnote in cultural history. I'm putting it front and center. I'm saying co our culture today was profoundly shaped by the great division between East and West that is centered upon this event in 1054. Um, yeah, that would be my argument. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And I also appreciate as a good historian there, the acknowledgement at the beginning of, you know, we, we would love to know more about these things, right? But but we have to maybe hold certain conclusions about what the average person on the street of Kiev thought about it loosely in light of the fact that we don't have all that data. But I think it's a fun question to explore to, to recognize that in some ways we, we kind of only understand these events in the rearview mirror in a lot of ways. And so as it develops over time, yeah. we, we can see, okay, this is a meaningful place to put the demarcation point, but it's not as though on the very next day, all of these things happened all at once. These are processes that um, as, as the churches kind of grow apart there, and you mentioned uh, kind of the cementing of that in a very visceral way with the sacking of Constantinople, which many people will highlight there. So I, I appreciate all of that. Before we dive in a little bit more to the schism, I just want to kind of rewind just a second back to the kind of prehistory to the schism, because throughout your books, there's this concept of paradise and um, not to, was John Milton paradise lost? Not to uh, plagiarize him, but there's this idea of that paradise going away, if you will. Um, what, what are you referring to when you talk about paradise? Because I imagine people might say, well, certainly not everything was perfect and rosy before 1054 and then everything was immediately bad. What is the concept of paradise that you're using here? Hey, we'll be right back to the interview, but first I want to tell you about another sponsor for today, and that is Faithful Counseling. Faithful Counseling is a group of Christian counselors that exist to help you get the help you need. You know, one of the first YouTube videos I ever made was called You Can Have Jesus and a Therapist Too. And what I wanted to do in that video was draw out the fact that so many people are struggling with mental health. And the last thing we want to do is make it more difficult for people to reach out to get the help they need by creating this stigma around it. It's something that I'm really passionate about and think we need to end in Christian circles. And that's why I'm so excited to be par partnering with Faithful Counseling. Their counselors all will be counseling from a Christian perspective, and you can connect with them from any country in the world. They have counselors that speak many different languages. And hey, if you, it's important to you to have a counselor from your specific tradition or background, they can do their part to try to pair you up with one of them as well. All of their counselors are licensed with over 3,000 hours of experience. You can connect with these counselors in a variety of ways. Four, in fact. You can do video sessions, phone calls, live chat, or messaging. All of the messaging is secure. And if it's between scheduled ses sessions, you will receive a response within 24 to 48 hours. If this is interesting to you, if you think this would be helpful for you or maybe a loved one, I'd encourage you to go to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. If you do that, first of all, you'll get 10% off your order and you'll be matched with a counselor in less than 24 hours. Hours. Again, that's faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity to be matched with a counselor in less than 24 hours and get 10% off your first month. Faithful Counseling costs $260 per month, which gets you unlimited messaging with your counselor in four 30 minute sessions. But again, if you go to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity, you'll get 10% off that first month. Lastly, Faithful Counseling is not a crisis line. If you are currently experiencing suicidal thoughts or ideation, please reach out to a crisis line or hotline. You can find one of them at www.crisistextline.org. Please do so. You can reach out. You do not have to do this alone. Well, thank you all so much, and I will let you get back to the video, but if you want to check them out, again, faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. The link is in my bio and in the pinned comment. Well, back to the interview. That's an, <clears throat> that's an important uh, question, I think. Yeah, very important. Uh, you mentioned Milton. It's, it's funny. I... Um, was taking an exam once 
I won't say where, what college and what teacher, but the uh, professor, um, I, I wrote something about um, the fall. And I, I think I worked in, you know, Adam stood outside of the gates of paradise weeping um, as a result. I was being, you know, somewhat poetic and I guess my account of this. And she called me up and she said, wow, you've been reading, where'd you get that from, Milton? And I said, no, I got it from Orthodox hymnography. We, we go through that every year uh, at Great Went before Great Went starts. We, we envision Adam outside of paradise weeping for his separation from it and rejoice in, in that um, Christ's incarnation has opened the gates of paradise to us again. The word paradise um, is an important one in my vocabulary as a cultural historian and a church historian, I guess. Um, and and in, in so far as it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's an interpretive device, that's how I you know, like to use this word and, and utopia, which the two of them together kind of define my vision of, of the history of the West. It's an interpretive device in that it, it, it enables us to evaluate and make sense of the past, interpret the past. It's a device. It's somewhat artificial in the sense that like I'm using it in a way that um, it might be used in very different ways and is used in different ways in other contexts by other authors. And I don't want to um, you know, claim that that's like my brand or something like that. That would be horrible. I would never do that. But what I believe is, <clears throat> is that traditional Christianity um, cultivated from day one. And I, my, my narrative begins at Pentecost. A lot of people, they look on Christendom and they think, oh, what's Christendom? Christendom is that like civilization of the Middle Ages, which is a term I don't use. The term medieval writes orthodoxy out of the, uh, out of the narrative just by definition, because the Middle Ages only defines what happened in Western Europe for a period of time that was dominated by, by the Roman Catholic influence in, in that civilization. Um, and then it came to an end uh, re reputedly with the Protestant Reformation, which leaves orthodoxy still out of the narrative. So I don't use the term medieval or middle ages. Uh, it's a modern term. Uh, it was invented in modern times in order to write Christianity out of the narrative of the history of the West. And so you get a, a tripartite three-part way of defining the history. There's ancient, and there's medieval, and then there's modern. And the medieval just comes in between. It, it means middle, right? It means it has no value in itself, that civilization, from this point of view. So anyway, back to the question, what does paradise mean? I think paradise, um, as I use it, is, is intended as an interpretive device to describe the culture, um, uh, what I call a paradisiacal culture, that, um, that orients, directs members of that culture toward the eternal kingdom of heaven that is revealed by Christ to the apostles and placed at the center of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the kingdom of heaven has broken into this world, the kingdom of heaven has drawn near, that this world now participates in heaven, in paradise, and the participation in that heavenly kingdom, even now in this life, um, is real and defines the culture that springs out of Pentecost and then really takes over after the conversion of Constantine, but not for 300 more years. My first volume talks about the third of the first volume is dedicated to everything before Constantine. So it's, it's by no means um, Christendom is established somehow by a church state relationship. It was already there transforming the culture according to its vision of paradise, the church was. And so that's what I consider paradise to be. I want to emphasize never, and I, I state this in the books, I, I'm afraid sometimes I've had people talk to me about the books and I get the sense that they didn't pick this up. Uh, I talk about this in the books. Never do I think the world becomes paradise. I, I emphatically state that it cannot become paradise. Um, par the kingdom of heaven is not of this world. <laughs> but it has broken into this world. And that's something that I think the Orthodox Church has kept alive in her, especially worship, but her piety generally. And that's kind of what I'm bringing as an Orthodox scholar to uh, a history, a 2000 year history of the West is that sense cultivated in me by my church and my, tr my church's tradition of um, participating in and experiencing um, the kingdom of heaven, even in this world. Once that participation in the kingdom of heaven withers, as I believe it does after the 11th century schism, then that creates new forces 
that resol resolve themselves in the rise of an alternative secular um, variant of paradise, which is utopia, an effort not to seek the kingdom of heaven, which is not of this world in this world, but rather to see the world as an end in itself and to create a seculum, a space in this world where we can you know, write great novels and build great um, governments and pursue a lot of great things, uh, human rights and all sorts of other reforms and, and so forth. Progress can occur, but it's not salvific. It's not grounded in the kingdom of heaven. It belongs exclusively to this world. And I believe that's what happens. And that's the story I'm telling in Age of Division. That's what happens as a consequence of the of the great division and the separation of the West from the East. All right, let's dive into that a bit because I think it's a fascinating thesis and the kind of hermeneutical key or the kind of the uh, interpretive device there of paradise and the inbreaking of the kingdom of God and the experience of that in this world without it kind of um, so saturating the whole world that there's no distinction there at all. I think it's a, a really interesting way to look at cultural history and to see how there's kind of divergent paths going on here. Now, for a clarification for my audience, because I think they'll be interested in this, they might, many of them haven't read the book yet, but I'm sure after this conversation, they'll click the link and they'll buy it and they'll read it and they'll love it. But, but in the meantime, when you say that after the schism, the the sense of the kingdom of God or the experience of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God in this world, paradise, if you will, uh, diminishes or, or withers, I think might have been the word you used. Is that because of the schism in the sense that not being in a, uh, kind of like an ecclesial union with the patriarch of Constantinople just kind of saps that of its efficacy? Kind of like you might say, the sacraments aren't kind of efficacious in a Catholic church. I don't know if you'd say that, but I know some people might say something like that. Or is it more of a result of moving away from some of the influences of the East? Does that question make sense? It does. It does make sense. And, and uh, you'll be disappointed to know it's both and <laughs> in my in my judgment. <clears throat> um, uh, I do certainly not uh, bring a great deal of, um, you might say, ecclesial kind of um, uh, conviction into into the book. Why well, I, I do, but I don't try to make statements about the effects of the sacraments and validity and stuff like that. That's just not my thing at all. Um, what I do believe is that um, ecclesial uh, ecclesiology matters. I guess we could put it this way. I think ecclesiology matters. My my narrative is shaped by an ecclesial or ecclesiological understanding of civilization. That a civilization. Um, has a culture. I, I define Christendom as a um, civilization with a supporting culture that directs its members toward the uh, heavenly transformation of the world, at least for the first millennium. Um, that changes into a secular transformation of the world after the um, after the, the Renaissance. But um, and and volume two, the Age of Division, is designed to show that transition and what happened. Um, I think that um, the, the sacramental life of the Orthodox Church um, is a very important part of shaping culture and was very important in that first millennium. Um, I, I make a lot out of the, the um, Eastern features of, of the West during that first millennium. One of my chapters is entitled, When the West Was Still Eastern. <laughs> it's not today, but it was once very Eastern. Um, there was a, a couple of centuries where all the popes of Rome themselves, the, the people who held that office, were from the Byzantine East. They might have been Greek, they might have been Syrian, but they were being recruited from the East, and they were in Rome, but they were very much shaped by an Eastern piety. Um, my first volume spends a lot of time talking about examples of popes like Gregory the Great, that any Roman Catholic would, would see, I mean, he's one of the four doctors of the church, the early church. He's a tremendously important and, and, and beloved saint in the Roman Catholic Church. And so he is in the Orthodox Church as well. And Gregory the Great, uh, who's arguably the most important pope, you know, before, before the Papal Reformation, Gregory the Great, um, he, he spent uh, years in Constantinople. He attended Hagia Sophia and the worship there. Um, for Orthodox, he helped compose. He, he had a role in, 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 in composing 
the, uh, the, the wonderful pre-sanctified divine liturgy that served during Great Lent on weekdays during Great Lent with its heavenly uh, experience of God's presence in this world. Now the powers of heaven with us invisibly do serve. The, one of the hymns has it where the Eucharist is brought in. Uh, lo, the king of glory enters. Lo, the, uh, the, the sacrifice is a born, fulfilled. Let us draw nigh with faith and love and become communicants of life eternal. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. That's a hymn um, that's contained within this liturgy that Gregory is said in, in the Eastern tradition. In the West, he's not seen this way, but in the Eastern tradition, somehow, mysteriously, we don't really know how, he contributed to the formation of this liturgy. Very, very um, paradisiacal in character. Again, Christ is present. The King of glory has drawn near to us. Let us draw near to him. Receive him. I believe that the Orthodox uh, Church did cultivate very strongly. It had the doctrine, you know, of deification. I know you've talked about deification in other episodes of your podcast and and kind of looked that through and thought about it from different points of view. Um, that That understanding of human salvation which puts primary emphasis upon man's participation in the life of the Holy Trinity, the life of God, um, th especially through sacramental life, as this is worked out, especially in hesychasm, for instance, Gregory Palamas and, and hesychasm. This is a very you know, rich tradition or part of Orthodox or Eastern piety that was shared in the West during, these, uh, during the first millennium. Um, and I think the West was really, you know, I call the, I was really being shaped by this Eastern piety. I call the East, uh, um, the East, the, uh, the cradle, uh, as well as, uh, you know, I, I call it the cradle of Western culture, but also the uh, guardian uh, of Western culture and the, the protector um, and the tutor uh, of Western culture during this first millennium. That began to change when the, the Frankish, empire was assembled with a specific goal, politically determined in many ways, so they were very Christian, very spiritual people, but nevertheless, uh, uh, the goal of separating itself from the Byzantine or R Roman East and that formation of the Frankish Empire, whose most famous ruler was Charlemagne, was a really important turning point away from uh, a Eastern West, a West that was shaped by and, and, and nourished by Eastern piety, Orthodox piety, and as it was defined in the East. Of course, the West was still Orthodox at that time. So that's that's an ecclesial, ecclesiological explanation. But your other question, like the two alternatives you gave me, um, again, to repeat, I think that communion matters. I think that communion does have an impact. It's mysterious and we can't define it, but I think it's important. And that's one of the things that a empirical historian would just like ignore, like, what are you going to do with that? You don't do anything with that. But I'm not exactly limited to that as, as an Orthodox Christian scholar and, and historian. But the other point you, you asked about, the other option was that it's um, that the, the change, the trans, transition is one that's just more cultural in, in definition. Here, I would pick up on what I said about the Franks a moment ago, and I would kind of lay at your feet that example. So here we're getting away from a, a kind of a mystical understanding of, of ecclesiology and, and, and shared communion and stuff like that, sacramental unity. And now we're looking at a more empirical way of understanding how the West changed. That change certainly was underway uh, as a result of the Frankish effort to define what they called the Greeks. This was a term they used to you know, isolate and kind of objectify what they were not. We are not the, like those Greek theologians. We are Frankish theologians. And th once the, the Frankish influence became so powerful that it could even win over the papacy and the papacy in the face of the unbelievable heresies that were going on in the East, um, the Orthodox papacy uh, rejected the heterodox or heretical um, Constantinople and, and, and Byzantine East during the iconoclastic controversy, the heroic papacy turned to the Franks for protection, and that kind of set the West under the influence of empire and uh, papacy on a direction that would eventually result in the Great Schism of 1054. I appreciate the both and, and I think the question itself, 
Well, I think it's a question. I, I try to anticipate questions people might have as well as the questions I have. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's probably a self-consciously post-enlightenment question to ask which one of those is it when those things could very well overlap and it doesn't have to be one or the other. So I appreciate you highlighting kind of both and there, the, the two aspects of it. And hopefully that will clarify um, kind of where you're coming from in some ways for my viewers. And so if I'm understanding this correctly, and you draw this out in your book, that not only, so 1054, it's decisive because of the excommunication, but there's already a trend towards kind of this separate Western identity forming at this time apart from the East, and then that kind of begins to snowball even more after 1054. Would you say that the schism of 1054 is in part, and I know we can't necessarily talk deterministically in terms of history here, but that it is a result of that waning influence of the East, that it's kind of the flowering of that, and then we see even more of its consequences afterwards. Would that be a fair way of characterizing it? If you're anything like me, you might have this vague sense that you should be investing, or you'd like to invest more to be a good steward of your money to prepare for the future and to be more generous by increasing the money that God has given you. But it can be a bit overwhelming, right? How do you know what stocks to pick and how do you know when to pick them or what to buy? And how are you sure that the money you're investing isn't actually supporting causes that go against your Christian moral convictions. Well, that is where C3, Christ-Centered Capital, comes in. Christ-Centered Capital is an organization that offers timely stock picks, mock portfolios, and investment analysis to help you align your Christian moral convictions with your money. What they do is they give recommended stocks and they analyze what these companies are doing as to whether or not you should be investing in them. So they're not only out to help you make money, but they're out to help you do so in an ethical way. Now they don't take your money and invest it for you, they're just giving you the advice on how to do so. You don't have to hand them off your money and wonder what they're going to do with it. You get to manage it yourself, but you'll be able to do so with the confidence knowing that you are investing in companies that don't contradict your values. I think this is a wonderful service to help simplify the complicated world of investing. And for just $7 a month, you can be getting their timely stock picks, their mock portfolios, investing advice, and more by going to ChristCenteredCapital.com. And just so you know, when you do that, that $7 a month, 50% of those profits will be going back to Christian organizations like Christian colleges, Christian charities helping clean water, pro-life organizations, and much more so you can rest assured that not only are they giving you good advice but the money you give them is going to good causes i'd encourage you to check them out christcenteredcapital.com to learn more today i would want to do this i would I, and this is what i do in in, um, in both volumes one and, and and volume two which also kind of recapitulates the end of vol volume one ends in the and on the eve of the um great schism and, and just as the for, for, at the end of the first millennium so that's a really important moment in the history of the formation of or the continued evolution of Western culture. We've already had the the we've already had Pentecost in the early church. We've already had the influence of the East um, on Rome and other parts. I and mean, we could look at the Celts and their amazing um, paradisiacal culture after they're converted. Um, the Franks, we've now talked about them. The next key development um, in explaining 1054 it's it's um, it's not so much that as you asked the East began to wane in its in its influence on the West. There was that, but what I would bring immediate attention to, I think, the immediate circumstances for the Great Schism were the rise of papal supremacy in a very heroic. I want to emphasize this: uh, papal supremacy for me, you know, it, it does mean something very significant that I I don't myself share as an Orthodox Christian, but I do recognize that historically. It was like there was nothing else that could be done considering the condition, the spiritual condition of the West in the 10th century. In the 10th century, um, you have um, you have, first of all, in Rome itself, uh, different partisan factions determining who, who can be made a pope. And many of the popes are just chosen because they're politically or economically prosperous or powerful. And you have some awful examples of, of popes at this time. Every Roman Catholic, you know, kind of would, would agree wholeheartedly 
that the, the popes of the, uh, the 10th century, the 900s, were really failing to live up to the high standards of that office. Um, but so the papacy kind of had a, a, a kind of a crisis that needed to be resolved internally. But then externally, the West was under the power of successors to the disruptions of the Viking invasions, uh, which, you know, a, a ninth century, especially. And then by the 10th century, the 900s, you have a lot of um, you have a lot of churches and, and monasteries ruled by secular powers. It's called the proprietary system proprietary system. And it really demoralized the West tremendously, its spiritual life. And from the office, from, 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 from Rome, and, and by the way, it wasn't the Vatican at this time, it was the Lateran Palace. Um, Vatican is, is something that's introduced as the capital, uh, uh, the center of the papacy only later. But for now, in the 11th century, at the Lateran Palace in Rome, where the p- Pope uh, resided, a uh, 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 really heroic assembly of big personalities, strong reformers uh, appear who say, we've got to do something about this. We can't just stand around and see all this degradation taking place. Peter Damien's one of these people, the future Gregory VII, Pope of Rome, Gregory VII, known as Hildebrand, is, is involved. The aforementioned Cardinal Humbert is involved. And they all come together as a kind of a reformist party. And for the first time in, in history, it's, it took a, a millennium really for it to appear, you have re, a, a reformation take place. And it's that papal reformation, which pr- the primary goal of which was to clean up and elevate the spiritual life of the West that sets in motion the great schism that came, well, about a generation after this got off the ground. It gets off the ground in the, in the pontificate of Leo the Ninth, um, and, and it's Leo the Ninth who sends the... Um, the embassy to Constantinople. He's the one who dies. He was actually in captivity. That's a really fascinating story I talk about in the anecdotal opening of Age of Division. He was actually in jail when he sent Humbert off to Constantinople. He felt paralyzed. He he had this investment in, in reforming the West, but he couldn't do that in jail. And furthermore, the Patriarch of Constantinople was an alternative center of power that he he needed to have submit to him in order to feel like he could take over leadership of, of Western reforma- reform, uh, the papal reformation is, is what that can be called. And that's, that, Austin, is that's the context for 1054, more than any other immediate one. Well, that's perfect, because the papal reformation is exactly where I wanted to go. And just kind of as an aside, I always find it interesting. I don't want to downplay the, the current difficulties that many of my Catholic viewers uh, are facing with kind of some ecclesial crisis is a word some might use. I know Ralph Martin uh, is a fan of that word. But in comparison to some of the the past difficulties the papacy has faced or some of the past popes that have been around, I think that's just one of the beauties of history is getting to contextualize current events in terms of there, there's there been some serious challenges in the past that uh, the, the church has gotten through, which might just... Uh, be helpful for people that are listening. But I do want to go to the Papal Reformation there because I think it's important. The The way you highlight it, both as a, a heroic thing in terms of kind of reforming the church and, and being able to gather these personalities together to really bring order there, but then it also is being referenced as kind of one of the causes of this schism, which leads to the decline of the West. And I can imagine some of my viewers wondering, like, how, how is it both, right? Because, for instance, for my Catholic viewers, they, they want to claim that the, the rise of kind of, the, that this papal reformation, it was a good thing, it was a needed thing, a heroic thing, in the words that you use. But they might feel uncomfortable saying that it's also the cause of the schism, right? And so, in what ways has, is this heroic thing of the papal reformation leading to kind of what you're pinpointing as the turning point towards the, the decline of the West. In other words, what, what could the, the papal reformation or the papal reformers have done differently facing the crisis that they were without it leading to the schism? Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good question. What could they have done differently? Um, some counterfactual historiography there. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm up to the uh, task. That's an interesting project, I think, to undertake. What, what, what could have happened? What, how could it have been differently? What might have been? That is a fascinating book topic, actually, um, which I don't think I'm ready to um, say anything, you know, significant or 
um, uh, interesting about right now. I think that, um, you know, just in general, the radical, um, I, I think any historian, any historian of, of what's called the Middle Ages, and especially this 11th century, agrees that the the policies of the popes and their backers, I, I mentioned Peter Damien and, and others, the policies of the popes were radical. They were radically different than what had uh, happened before. They're not completely you know, out of the blue. There's not like there was never any evidence of this kind of behavior before. Leo I is often pointed to as an early 6th century pope who, um, I'm sorry, 5th century pope, who, who said a lot of very important things about the role of the papacy and its authority, especially in the West. Um, but there was never any, um, any claims before the 11th century that the entire church must submit to the uh, authority of the Pope of Rome, a doctrine which gets uh, a kind of later and more even extreme uh, or, um, expression in the famous Unum Sanctum of Boniface VIII. Uh, it is necessary for the salvation of every human being to be subject to the Pope of Rome. That's a radical change of ecclesiology. Ecclesiology is no longer centered upon the, the local bishop in communion with other local bishops, with his clergy under him and the people gathering together in local church parish churches, participating sacramentally in the body and blood of Christ, and that it's the presence of Jesus Christ, the head of the church, that unites this ecclesial community together now it's a an office. It's a legally defined office that was that was deemed necessary for the papacy to have the authority needed to shake up and improve the West, as I described it briefly a moment ago. And so what you what you find here is that making um, a, a a commitment to using the office of the Pope rather than the more mystically defined experience of of the Church as the body of Christ. But the office of the Pope with, you know, cadres of, you know, you might say activists or reformers um, uh, working under him and, and for the same end, the, 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 the bishops, the cardinals now that are created and, and the bishops and the, the, the clergy and the monks especially. What you get is an institutionalization then of reform. Uh, one of the things I make a point of uh, toward the end of volume two uh, Age of Division, and also again at the beginning of Volume Three, Age of uh, Utopia, is that the Protestant Reformation, when it comes, I mean, this is one of the things an Orthodox point of view helps with, um, because we don't get this in our own culture internally. The Protestant Reformation is an extension of the Papal Reformation. Um, the Protestant Reformation was not like uh, for the first time ever there were efforts to clean up the church. That had been institutionalized in the 11th century with the Papal Reformation, and I think those two. Um, events in the history of the West are very closely related, and because of their close close relationship, really help explain why we wound up where we are today. Um, and again, I think you have questions about what caused that to have an impact on what came later. Uh, but to try to summarize, I think once the papacy is seen as an institution that, that institutionalizes um, reform, or what we might call, I, I use this term, I think you picked up on it in our exchange, I noticed it, a transformational imperative. I, I use that term throughout all four volumes. I see that as being at the core of the cosmology or understanding of the world that is contained within traditional Christianity from Pentecost forward, a transformational imperative that members of this civilization called Christendom have a built-in need to transform the world, the cosmos. That for a millennium, that transformation was heavenly. That is to say, the experience was mystical. It took place largely within the, the, the spiritual experience of, of, of people participating in the liturgy and the sacraments of the church. But beginning with the Papal Reformation, it became institutional. It became directed toward kind of targeted ends, like we've got to clean up these monasteries. We've got to um, use Cluny, which is a famous uh, so Southern French monastery that helps lead the reform effort. And then Citeaux and the Cistercian orders founded and other agents of this reformation become institutionalized. And once that institutionalization of what had formerly been um, a, a more mystical understanding of transformation uh, occurred, then 
we begin to see other things happen that diminish or weaken the paradisiacal culture that is at the center of my attention here. We could talk about some of those things if you'd like. Yeah, I think that that probably makes the most sense to turn to some of those effects here. Um, and you you list a lot of them. I mean, everything from, I think one of the ones that just stood out to me as I reflect back on it, talking even about the the involvement of the laity in uh, the liturgy at, down to the, the baking of the bread and how changes in that changes the involvement of the laity in the service. We don't have to jump into that, but I think one of the big ones, one of the kind of the hot topic uh, things or th something that a lot of people will point to as kind of a, a difference between the East and the West, and you, you touch on it a bit, is the approach to theology. Now, I know that properly speaking, this is a, a cultural history, but I think this in some ways falls under that as well with the rise of scholasticism. Can you talk a little bit about how this relates to the schism? Sure. Um, I mean, as much as I'm able, I'm not trained in theology and I would never claim to, you know, have a handle on scholastic theology. I don't. Um, but I've you know, done some research and I, I, I've done enough that I think I can you know, speak at least, um, you know, superficially about some of the developments that occurred and how they relate to the larger culture. You know, what I'm offering is a long term history. It's not a, a, a localized, very intensive you know, um, study of one topic, I'm trying to see the bigger picture here. And scholasticism as a theological movement has a place in that bigger picture. Um, let me preface that by just saying, you know, you, you mentioned the laity not playing uh, as much of a role. I, you know, if, if one wants to just list kind of the leading signs that something had changed, you know, because you mentioned like one might say, okay, well, the you know, papacy played this role, but that doesn't explain cultural phenomena. It doesn't explain other things. And, and it does take some explaining, it does take some work to work that out. But there's, it's remarkable how different Christendom, Western, I call it the new Christendom. It's so different in my evaluation than the old Christendom of the first millennium, East and West. And I believe that old Christendom continued in the East, uh, at least up until uh, the fall of Constantinople to the Turks, in the 15th century, and then later the rise of uh, Westernism uh, in Peter the Great's Russia in the uh, 17th, 18th centuries. But um, this new Christendom really is radically different in character. I mean, just look at all of the things that start to um, uh, appear in the culture and civilization of the West after that 11th century. Not only papal supremacy with a very legalistic understanding of church membership, ecclesiology now is, is, is evident. Um, you have, for instance, the first crusades fought within a generation. There had never been crusades. There have been religious violence. Christians are as given to violence, I suppose, as anyone is on earth. And Christianity doesn't protect us from, I, you know, I, you mentioned I, paradise. The, the first millennium was by no means a golden age. I never want to come across suggesting that. There were horrible things going on, and I document a lot. Of, a lot of them took place in the East, especially at the court of those Byzantine emperors. But you have the Crusades starting, and those become, you know, a centuries-long phenomenon. Um, never occurred before. There were canons in the ancient church that you can't kill people, even in warfare, even in a justified war, uh, and still receive communion. But now, fighting wars um, against infidels or even Orthodox Christians or heretical Western Christians becomes salvific, according to those crusades. Um, you, you've got the rise of, uh, you've got the rise of doctrines that weren't there before, like purgatory. It had been a theological opinion before, and it's perfectly appropriate to hold theological opinions, but as a dogma, it really doesn't show up until about the 12th century. Um, and, and so purgatory takes its place. Purgatory projects the experience of paradise, the kingdom of heaven beyond this world, and even who knows how, I mean, sometimes they spoke about thousands of years, you know, beyond this world. It's, it's hard to understand what a year would be like after you die, but, but there's this idea that, you know, this post-mortem punishment is needed before you can really delight and enjoy the, the presence of, 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 of spiritual transformation in, in paradise. So these things really have an impact and they're all kind of happening at the same time. Um, uh, the use of, uh, of, of um, only one language, Latin, that really becomes important. Um, other little details begin to occur as well. Um, uh, 
unleavened bread, which was a big dividing issue. I don't want to get into that because it's not a big deal for me, but it was a big deal for people a million, a thousand years ago. And um, the use of unleavened wafers, unleavened bread is introduced in the West. Our first document, if I'm not mistaken, is the ninth century Franks. And then it becomes institutionalized in, in Rome you know, in the 11th century beyond. The filioque, 11th century is when that's introduced in Rome, in the mass in Rome. Uh, there are a lot of things that suddenly change. Um, the clericalism. If, if now the church is seen, the church is seen as, a, as the pope and a body of clergy that now are celibate, and that's also a big reform that takes place, that the clergy must be celibate, and there's a campaign to make sure they all are, um, they're set apart from the laity who are married. The, the priest in the local parish church is different than the laity in this sense as a real separation. I call it a bifurcation of, of Christian society. And the laity are kind of put in a position of secondary, almost um, observers as, as spiritual life plays out. So there are really quite a few changes that occur. But you've brought attention um, to one of those, and that's scholasticism, which also appears in the 11th century. Um, it, it grows out of um, a number of forces. One was the discovery of Aristotle through contacts with the Arabs who had translated Aristotle. Uh, it also has something to do with the internal dynamics of the West. Um, there is a tendency toward, uh, after the Franks, toward um, rationalism in, in theological reflection. There had always been uh, an element of rationalism, you might call it. There had always been reason, certainly, in theology. The Eastern um, as well as Western early fathers used Aristotle and Plato. You know, Augustine used a lot of Plato. Eastern fathers used, you know, made use of these these uh, pagan um, philosophers. But Aristotle really is uh, appropriated. You know, Thomas Aquinas, the greatest scholastic, calls him the philosopher, right? And and I think it would be silly to argue that there's really no difference that this the the impression that scholasticism is a change, a sea change in theology is, is a chimera. It didn't, it doesn't really have any validity. If you look at Thomas Aquinas, he was super mystical. He loved, for instance, I, I, I know he loved um, the mystic um, uh, uh, St. Dionysius, the Areopagite. Um, he liked to say all of his theological writings were nothing but straw, you know, at the end of his life, beautiful statements, you know, humble statements, mystical statements made by him, but he did, and, uh, and he did make a, 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 a great deal out of Aristotle. And we do see not only rationalism, you know, in, in trying to define what happens when the Eucharist becomes the body and blood of Christ, like that had never been like, everyone agreed it happened, but no one tried to kind of explain it, like get their mind in control of that. And you really see this kind of the, the reason trying to get control of what were mysteries before. In, in, in traditional Christianity. Legalism enters in at this time alongside that scholasticism you asked me about. Um, the university systems created and law faculties are uh, arranged so that people can write canons, huge bodies of canons defining normative Christianity from a Roman Catholic point of view are produced, which in the, in the effect of, uh, we may talk about penitential pessimism, in the effect of penance and stuff like that begin to emphasize like a, a much more routine, ritual-based, um, pro forma approach to repentance, which had not always been seen that way in the history of Christendom. So scholasticism does play an important role. How could it not? Because it, it shapes the thinking process, the pattern of thinking that obviously is going to have an impact on culture generally. And that is something we can date undoubtedly to the post-Great Schism um, centuries. There's no question about this. I want to pick up where you uh, started to leave that off there with the idea of penitential piety. I think it is a really fascinating thing. And was one of the, the areas of your book I found really interesting. Anecdotally, I'm currently actually at the, after I finish doing this interview, I will be finishing up um, a, a writing sample for applications to programs in medieval studies and lay the devotional piety and things of the of that sort are of special interest to me. And so I enjoyed this part of your book. Can you talk a bit about the kind of rise of penitential piety here, what that means and maybe how that moves away from the paradisaical view of the world? Yeah, I think that's really important, Austin. It really is. And uh, again, I'm not a specialist in this. This is not 
something that I've, you know, spent, you know, my lifetime researching and understanding. Other people, Rachel Fulton, for instance, is one such person. I think you interviewed her, did you not? Uh, uh, yeah, her interview will probably be the one right before this. I mean, it's out now. Okay. And then yours will be the one after that. So, yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah, very good. So she's done a marvelous job, you know, researching that and written a lot about it and knows a lot more about it than I do. Um, but what I, what, I do, what I do think I see here uh, in the piety of, of the period after the, the Great Division, the 11th century to, let's say, the 15th century, um, is a, um, an emphasis upon uh, 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 grief, sorrow, anxiety, uh, uh, um, uh, disquietude. Um, again, a lot of this can be connected to other things going on in the culture of the West, the new Christendom. Uh, I mentioned already purgatory. Once purgatory is introduced as a necessary process for almost every Christian, save the, the, the rare saint who goes straight to heaven, once that's introduced, then there's this terrifying, you know, po- prospect of being punished in a way that's hellish, that I mean, a lot of accounts during this time, and this changes over time. So a modern Roman Catholic understanding of purgatory would not necessarily say it this way. And, and again, I don't pretend to, to have studied all this in, uh, exhaustively. But I do know that the sources from this period of time emphasize the agony, the, the horrifying um, agony that people will undergo in purgatory and for a very long time. Some of this is built into the vision of, uh, of course, the famous vision of Dante, the th- second of his three uh, volume uh, Divine Comedy uh, is Purgatory. Um, and and it's, pretty, it's pretty hard to see what's going on in, in, in some of the uh, 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 purgatorial sufferings people have to go through. But Dante was kind of a, a light, uh, had a light touch. Uh, there are other accounts like the Purgatory of St. Patrick, uh, which is a description of going to hell basically. Uh, from this period of time, going to hell, but being able to escape it. <laughs> That's the thing about purgatory is you go to hell, but it doesn't last eternally. That's scary. And people began to really agonize over what's going to happen to me. Um, there were, there was, uh, this manifests itself in a lot of the other elements of piety. That's more doctrinal, but, but um, the penitential pessimism can be found uh, in a new um, range of images that emphasize Jesus agony on the cross. Of course, it's traditional Christian conviction that Jesus suffered and died on the cross for the sins of the world. There's no question about this, that the salvation of the human race was worked out on the cross um, by Jesus Christ, and that that suffering was real. Um, but there, if you read the Gospels, there's not, I mean, they don't, there's no sense of, there's no blood, it's not a bloodbath, is it? The, the crucifixion is not a bloodbath in, in the Gospels. But by the end of this period, uh, by the 1300s and 1400s, you have crucifix iconography. It's questionable if it's even, you know, could be properly called iconography in a conventional sense at this point, that is designed to uh, cause horror in the people who see it. Uh, the, the contorted, twisted, broken, bleeding body of Jesus is so graphically depicted uh, in some of this. I think, you know, one of the earliest examples is the, is the 10th century Giro crucifix, which shows Christ dead and slumped and, and, uh, and, and, and more um, emphasizing his, his death than his coming resurrection. Traditional uh, iconography, especially found in Byzantium, had emphasized a Christ on the cross who, yes, is dying or has died, but his body's beautiful. Uh, it's, it's, it's radiant with, with beauty and light, and it's all a proclamation of the coming resurrection. Now like that resurrection is like suspended and there's a just attention to the agony of Christ. Um, you, the, uh, Eason, uh, uh, the Eisenberg uh, crucifix, for instance, Eisenheim, I'm sorry, Eisenheim crucifix of the 15th century. Um, if you look at that, Google it, type it up, look at it. It's like, whoa, that is really horrifying stuff, ghastly to look at. That becomes the art of of the West under the influence of this penitential pessimism, uncertainty about one's salvation, an experience of 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 salvation that's um, that's uh, that's that's suspended until a postmortem punishment has been worked out. Um, Images of Christ that are intended to cause someone to feel guilt and uh, grief over the fact that they caused Jesus to go through these 
horrifying, visually horrifying agonies. Um, there's no question that St. Anselm of Canterbury in the 11th century, uh, uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, um, and many others who followed um, uh, were emphasizing the effective response, the emotional response of people to the suffering of Christ. And by like the goal now of the piety is to make you feel guilty, make you feel horrible that Jesus had to go through this for your sake. Now, there is something healthy in that. There's an element of healthy Christianity, I think, in that. But it went so overboard that it caused a tremendous disruption to the paradisiacal culture that the West had inherited from that first millennium. And that that decline of the paradisiacal culture, which was about resurrection, was about deification, which was about the joy of experiencing paradise, you know, in the mass, standing at the mass and 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 participating in the, in the Holy Eucharist. Now the laity is more and more isolated from the clergy standing at the altar. And the closest they get is when the chalice is raised, you know, and people would come streaming in at that moment just to see the chalice raised and the, the miracle work. And then they go back to, out into the street and do something else. Some of the accounts from the Middle Ages speak of this. This all had a detrimental effect on the paradisiacal culture that had been generated in the old Christendom for a millennium, but which has gone into decline since the great division of the 11th century. Yeah, I really love the way you're able to kind of paint that picture of the the very physical differences that are happening as far as the, the separation there and also the idea of kind of rewinding from the resurrection to the crucifixion and kind of fixating on that or kind of um, pausing on the resurrection. Not to say at all that the, the West didn't believe in the resurrection by any means, but course, yeah. where is the, the focus of devotion there? I think that's it's a really interesting thing to think about and the way that relates to how we see the world generally. Are, are we living in that inbreaking of the kingdom of God or is that kind of pushed off further and further? I think that there's a lot for people to think about there. I think that's probably the final thing we'll talk about in terms of the impacts of the schism. This has been a really fun conversation. Before we wrap up with just a couple quick questions, I do want to end on this closing question. Having looked at all of this, and I know that you are an Orthodox priest, and so part of the answer to this might just be simply become Orthodox, but for someone living in the West that feels this tension of that the West does seem to have this decline, whether they put that at the schism or at the Enlightenment, at the Reformation, that there's this sense that something's wrong and that we're, we're looking for where it went wrong. You're placing that at the schism, and I think you've put uh, a lot of good arguments together for that. What what can Western Christians do to regain that sense of paradise? Is is there anything short of becoming Orthodox and restoring communion there that could lead towards a more paradisical view of the world? Or is that really at bottom the only answer? So I would, you know, as a, as a, as a, a con convinced Orthodox Christian, I would obviously emphasize the value of, of returning to what I understand to be the original faith of, 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 of Christianity, <clears throat> which I define as the Orthodox faith. Um, but, but no, I would not say that um, I've, I've painted a picture, the, uh, uh, I've, I've, create, I've, I've brought attention to a problem, the only solution to which is universal conversion to orthodoxy. Um, I, I, I think that that obviously would have a tremendous impact, but it's unlikely, obviously, to happen at a, at a large level. Orthodoxy remains the best kept religious secret in America, even though that's changing through channels like your own, actually. Um, people are learning more and more about it. Um, I think that what is needed, Austin, is, um, you know, what would, and, and I have to say, I, I'm an historian, okay? So I, I said at the beginning, my project is to explain where we are today by looking at the deep past, going well back beyond the conventional points of reference to understand why we're dealing with our, a secularized, postmodern, anti-Christian kind of thing going on in our culture today. But um, I'm going to have to take responsibility for understanding that culture in the last part of my um, forthcoming volume four, Age of Nihilism, because I'm going to be talking about it the role of universities, the role of, um, uh, of, of movie and, and music producers, the role of, uh, of, of politicians uh, in, in advancing this, this anti-Christian kind of agenda. I will have to understand that better, but I don't 
claim to be a, a kind of a culture critic, someone who's really exhaustively studied our culture today and knows kind of exactly what's wrong with it and, and what the solutions to it are. Uh, so, but with that said, I think that the, the, the picture that I'm painting and the problem that I'm identifying, um, the problem is solved as we return to traditional Christianity. My books, for instance, you know, are very explicit in using the term traditional Christianity. For me, that means orthodoxy. But I can, I certainly recognize that Roman Catholicism and Protestantism also have elements of traditional Christianity within them. There's no question about this to me. Um, uh, there's no question. And so um, I think it's by returning to those first millennium elements of our, um, of our culture, which we share together, whether we're Orthodox, Roman Catholic, or Protestant, I think returning to that experience of paradise which I throughout, um, especially volume one, I locate, I talk about things like government and art and stuff like that, but I center it all upon and claim it springs out of like a source from the liturgical sacramental life of the church, East and West, divine liturgy in the East, the mass in the West, both of these were the, um, the sources for a paradisiacal culture. So I think as far as, um, uh, today, if, if Christians who are not Orthodox, um, you know, and, and have a strong conviction about the Roman Catholic or Protestant faith that they hold, uh, want to think in terms of like finding a solution to the problem we have today, it's going to be found by returning to the roots, uh, their own roots, which will take them back to a, uh, a, a, an approach to uh, Christianity that is centered upon liturgy centered upon sacramental communion with God, the experience of God's presence, of, of, of heavenly imminence, that the, the kingdom of heaven has drawn near and is filling this world. And that pessimism begins to dis dissipate insofar as we experience God's loving, caring presence in this world through liturgy, through common worship, and through sacramental communion. This is all going to um, help like uh, correct, it's the ship of Christendom is healing over dangerously, perhaps almost capsizing. Some people would say probably today it will correct itself insofar as the ballast returns to liturgy and sacramental communion with God. Um, it's been it's been thrown off keel by secular secularization um, and and utopian thinking in modern times. And I think the way back is to to return to that first millennium um, source of our common Western culture, uh, which is communion with God through liturgy and the sacraments. That's really fantastic. I appreciate that answer. And I think a lot of my viewers will be encouraged by that. And I know they will anticipate uh, with, with great excitement uh, that fourth volume where you get into some of those things in the age of nihilism. So thank you so much for the work that you've done on this project. I can only imagine the amount of work that has gone into such an expansive history. And so thanks for all of your work on that. And thanks for coming on the channel today to discuss these things. I always like to close here on the channel with uh, what I call the final four. It's just four kind of rapid fire questions, uh, one word, one sentence answers, just to help people get to know the guest a little more. So. With that being said, the first one of those is, what has been the most fruitful habit or spiritual discipline in your life? I would say that attending um, what uh, we in my church call the Resurrectional Vigil on Saturday evenings in preparation for the Divine Liturgy on Sunday morning is, um, is that. Um, obviously, attending Sunday services is, is the key, is, this, is the most important, but <clears throat> in the ancient tradition of the church, beginning in Jerusalem in the fourth century, there was a long series of prayers and, and, and hymnography and gospel, Bible, scripture readings and so forth called the Resurrectional Vigil. It was a vigil kept all night long until the cock crowed on the day of the Lord, the first day of the week, which is also the eighth day of creation, taking us into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, in the Eastern church, I think it's still true in, in Western churches, Sunday, the day of the Lord in most languages, uh, not in English, but in most uh, European languages, um, was the, is the day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we rise up in joy on that day. And we get ready for it by attending a service that is designed to keep us in expectation 
waiting, using the cosmos and the darkness that comes over the world after sunset Saturday evening and waiting and waiting and waiting and watching and watching. It's very biblical to do this, right? The Matthew 25, behold, the bridegroom comes at midnight, things like that. And then celebrating the day of the Lord with the divine liturgy. This is the wonderful thing that we do as Christians, certainly in the Orthodox tradition. And so assembling together for not a separate liturgy, it's not a liturgy, it's it's a preparatory series of services, Vespers and Matins combined together to call uh, to to uh, to uh, call the resurrectional vigil on a weekly basis to experience the joy of the resurrection. Fascinating. I wasn't even aware of that. I, I've learned many things today, but that is one of them. So thank you for that. All right. Second question saw, outside. If I may, I saw you, uh, you've, you've attended Orthodox liturgies mm-hmm. before and enjoyed it. So let me recommend to you the resurrectional vigil on a Saturday evening. It's really All right. something beautiful. All yeah. right. I will have to check that out. I appreciate that. I'll, uh, I'll file that away and, and hopefully be able to make it to one. Second question outside the Bible. What has been the most impactful book on your life? The Idiot by Dostoevsky. Mm-hmm. I actually got it into one sentence there, didn't I? <laughs> there you go. All right. Good choice. All right. So you're having coffee with your undergrad or early grad school self. I know you've been through a decent amount of schooling, so pick either one. Uh, what's one piece of advice you give him for his future in, uh, as a historian? I would say um, study what you love. Make your study your life. Don't study something that is going to be marketable. I had a professor as a graduate student at a secular university who looked on my project to study the history of the Orthodox Church in Russia before the revolution, became my first book, The Making of Holy Russia. Um, He said, well, if you must, but that's not marketable. And he's probably right. I didn't get the job that I, the jobs I applied for at secular universities coming out of graduate school, Um, but I don't regret it one bit. Do what you love. Take your your intellectual curiosity into what matters and, and live, live uh, through that, through those studies. Mm, that, that's great advice. All right. Final one is that this channel is called gospel simplicity, but it's often pointed out that the topics can often be a bit on the complex side, which has resulted in some people asking me, will I rename the channel gospel complexity to which I answer with a resounding never. But if you had to answer the question, what is the gospel? What would you say? The gospel is the good news. Of course, that's what it means, right? So the good news that God did not remain aloof in heaven, um, looking down with contempt on our sins, but became one of us, joined himself to us, offered to us salvation and participation in his divinity, that we might be raised out of uh, the despair of sin and darkness and death and uh, and enjoy um, life in him uh, for all eternity. And that's for every human being. That's good news. Indeed it is. Well, Father John, thank you so much for being here today. Once again, the link uh, to your books will be in the description down below if you all want to check them out. But I want to thank all of you as well for being here, for watching this, especially if you've come all the way to this point. Thank you so much for your time. I do not take that lightly. I'll close as I always do by saying until next time, go out and love God and love others because truly above all else, that will change the world.